Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast. <laughs> I just had to screw it up from the beginning. This is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast, episode number 34. And um, yeah, we got some stuff today. Not that many news, actually, not that many even libraries and demos. But we do have a major releases and announcements this week because there was a React conf and we got a few pretty exciting things out of that. So let's get started, shall we? The first article we got today is called GraphQL, a success story for PayPal checkout. And this is essentially um, just as it says, you know, success story talking about how the PayPal engineers applied GraphQL at the PayPal to simplify the checkout procedure and uh, from the description, at least offload the work from the UI team, you know, so that they, uh, instead of battling with the REST APIs, as they say it themselves, would actually just use GraphQL, which is actually a very interesting point. I haven't thought about that much. Uh, hey, Elton John, welcome to the stream. Um, that is a weird phrase I thought I would never say, but there we go. <laughs> but yeah, let's, let's get back to the article. So... Um, as I said, the article talks about the advantages of switching from the REST to the GraphQL API for a very specific uh, checkout use case and what exactly the GraphQL brought as, you know, in terms of advantages to the UI team. And uh, it is quite interesting, but I would just thought that, you know, I would leave you with this one highlight from the article that is there, that it uh, says basically, when we took a closer look, we found that UI developers were spending less than one third of their time actually building UIs. The rest of the time spent was figuring out where and how to fetch data, filtering mapping over the data and orchestrating many API calls. Sprinkle in some build deploy overhead. Now building UI is nice to have afterthought, which is a very surprising thing. And I know I never thought about it at that time, but now that I'm actually looking at all my um, experience building UIs, it actually does ring the bell quite hard. I do spend a lot of time actually managing the data and REST API calls instead of building the actual UIs most of the time. So I might give GraphQL a second shot and see if that would help me in a couple of my projects. So yeah, what is GraphQL? Oh, you know what? I forgot. Wait a second. Let me just put the chat over here because I totally forgot to do that. Uh, GraphQL is a query language that is supposed to replace the whole REST pipeline and uh, supposed to simplify the whole data querying and uh, modifying on the server. It is quite nice, but I so far was not convinced basically by its usefulness. Uh, maybe just my use cases, you know, structure, data structure wise was not quite good enough for it or fit enough for it, but it is a very neat thing. So basically here's a nice example uh, of how it looks. You describe the data by defining a type and fields that it has. And then you can uh, write queries like this where you ask for a project with a specific name and you only want a tagline of that project back. And that's literally what you get as a JSON back, which is really cool. So basically you can define the structures that you want to get back as a UI for the specific query. It's a pretty flexible thing though. If you never worked with it, I definitely recommend that you at least check it out because it's a very cool tool. Uh, it does not definitely doesn't fit all the use cases, but it might be very helpful in some of them, as you can see here from the PayPal engineering team. So if that sounds interesting, do check out the article. It is quite interesting and there are some very uh, cool points in there. Right, next article we got is testing React components, the mostly definitive guide featuring React test renderer. Um, just as the title says, this is a very, very big article. Uh, and this is, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even call it mostly definitive. I would call it the definitive guide because there is basically just about everything you want to know about testing React components. It is talking about the whole setup from the very scratch, from testing very basic components, uh, using the snapshot testing, going to React Renderer and go into more complex thing like behavior testing, state testing, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, hey, Samohavitz, welcome to the stream. So yes, if you are having troubles with testing React components, or if you wanted to improve your skills with regards to testing the components, then do check this article out. It basically has everything you have to know about testing React components. I'm not sure why the mostly word here, I guess the author just didn't want to be, you know, like claiming that everything is there, but um, yes. Uh, oh, hey, Mandaputra, welcome to the stream. Hello from Asia. Yes, I remember you said that you was like 2 a.m. for you in there. I would die from watching streams at 2 a.m., would not recommend. 
But thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's continue. The next article we got is Authenticate a Node ES6 API with JSON Web Tokens. This is a JSON Web Token tutorial for authentication and using it with um, basic REST API using Express and all your typical Express related things, basically, right? So if you like, there's nothing super, um, how do you put it? Super specific here. So it's nothing super special here, not specific. Super special is a proper way of saying it, let's say. So there's nothing special in this tutorial, but if you never worked with uh, JSON Web Tokens and if you were wondering how you can actually use them to secure a REST API, this is a very good guide that will guide you through everything that you want to know, including testing it with a postman, so visually testing and manually testing, let's put it this way. And uh, yeah, it is a very basic one, but it basically gives you all the starting point that you need to know um, on how to secure your API using JSON Web Tokens and how to use JSON Web Tokens with Express.js. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It is quite good. Next article we got is we all need automated tests, rent.js. This is very much a meta article. So it's a rant as it says, and it talks about why, why does projects need tests, right? So it's, it's an opinion, it's an opinion article, as you might imagine, and it's heavily opinionated, obviously, but I tend to agree with the most points in it, right? So the author talks about, so why do we actually need tests? Why do we want to have tests? How do you actually want to test why 100% coverage is not something that is 100% needed? And I already said that, you know, I completely agree with it. I don't think 100% test coverage is something that you need, absolutely need to have. Neither will 100% test coverage save you from all the problems. Uh, but yes, there are some things that you absolutely must test, like, you know, business critical features, error occurrence, and things like this. So the article goes to talk about most of that stuff. Hey, Haptic, welcome to the stream. Um, and then it goes into, you know, more meta discussion on why is everything on fire? Where did my weekends go? And how does this happen if you don't running test, if you're not running tests, you know, why you should run tests. So if you're interested in the whole automatic te automated test area, let's put it this way, if you're interested in maybe TDD and uh, check it out. Um, I think you should test everything. Well, testing everything as in you know every line of code is not it's not going to help you right so 100 percent, as i already said 100 percent test coverage does not guarantee that everything will work as expected because majority of the like the nastiest bugs you can actually get they are not the one from the you know line by line code they're actually logical most of the time so i i think that testing everything while if you if you if you actually can afford that that's really cool and you should absolutely do that but most of the time it's enough if you test business critical features and if you do some end-to-end uh, -end and integration testing. It does not guarantee, no, but can it hurt? No, it definitely doesn't hurt. Like the only problem is the resources available, right? So if you have enough resources, enough time, enough manpower to actually do 100% coverage, go for it. That's absolutely no questions. The problem is that you don't really always have those resources, right? So. Um, I'm just saying that is basically if you have very limited resources and there's not enough time to achieve this 100% test coverage, then it's not worth fighting for it, right? Okay, um, yeah, this is basically a PM piece on testing. Do check it out if you're interested in the, in the area. It is pretty well written. Okay, continuing, we got a really cool post from the Mozilla Hacks team from the uh, Link Clark, who uh, tends to make a very awesome cartoony posts. This time around, the post is called WebAssembly's Post MVP Future, a cartoon skill tree. And it talks about, as you might imagine, the future of WebAssembly on the web, what was achieved. Uh, we have the minimum viable product right now, right? How does the minimum viable product right now look? So we have the compilation, we have the fast execution, we have the compact format, we have the linear memory. And this is sort of our MVP right now. Well, it's actually a bit more than that, to be honest. Um, there are some features that are already implemented in some browsers and then, you know, in a pipeline and others. But um, the idea here is that the author looks behind, you know, like beyond that. So what, what is, where is WebAssembly moving and what it actually should achieve? So we, we're gonna have like heavyweight desktop apps, right? So they will need threading and threading is by the way, already coming to the Chrome, for example. 
They will need stuff like SIMD, and I think this is gonna be in Chrome quite soon as well. There's also 64-bit addressing, which I don't think I've heard about anyone implementing yet, but I might be mistaken here. Maybe Firefox already have it in pipeline. Streaming compilation, which is already landed actually in, at least in Chrome, I think it was in Firefox already as well, might be wrong at this point. But anyway, you get the idea. So it basically talks about all the features that we would need in future if we want to build a real apps with WebAssembly, right? Not just like some tiny modules, but a proper heavyweight apps that would do heavy lifting for us instead of JavaScript and blocking the main thread. So it's a very interesting um, article to read and very interesting to see the insights of a person who essentially works on a browser team and knows where exactly the whole industry is moving, right? Because as much as I read about WebAssembly, I will never have the same level of insight into it than a person working on a team who is actually need to communicate with the industry and deliver something that actually works. So it's really, really cool. And if you have even slight interest in um, knowing where the WebAssembly is moving and what kind of demands the industry has for it, including the Node.js IoT side of the things and all that kind of stuff, do check this article out. It is really, really cool. Okay. Next article we got is uh, probably my favorite announcement of the week. It's called Introducing Hooks. And this is from the React team. So it's basically introducing React Hooks. And it's a new feature, new proposal to React that is now released in React 16.7 Alpha. It has been announced on React Conf this week. And it allows you to use a bunch of uh, features that were available for React classes inside of React functional components, like, for example, state, like, for example, effects, like, for example, uh, custom hooks. And, um, well, straight up, this feature is amazing. It allows you to do incredibly simple things using functional components. And, you know, there's like, if you, if you are, there's going to be a link later on onto the React Conf itself. If you are in, have even, have a slightest interest in React, do check it out. And you will see how much hooks can simplify some things that you can build with React right now. And, um, you know, I mean, you can build them and they work and they're, not extremely complex, but still it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to read like the render props, for example, being one of the problems. And how you can use actually hooks that will simplify that like by 20 or even, you know, more, um, I guess, nestedness or something like this, you know? It is incredible. And uh, the cool thing is that the hooks are so, um, or let me put it this way. The hooks are such an incredibly well thought through idea that other frameworks already stated they're going to be implementing in them as well. So the Preact already has um, an alpha version ready of the hooks and the Vue.js just announced they're working on the hooks as well. Hey, Bako, welcome to the stream. I am doing good as you can see and I'm being all hyped up about hooks over here. <laughs> So yes, uh, pretty excited to see all of that develop. Um, we might play with hooks at some point in the, um, in the future live streams. Maybe we even move some of our code to them. They are still, so they're still uh, on RFC stage, so they're not production ready. Uh, and they're gonna be on RFC stage for the next month. So you can, well, you can use them in your apps right now by using React Next or React Alpha, but um, it's basically since they are in RFC and they're waiting for the comments from the community, there is a chance they might break. Um, hooks are everywhere. Is there hooks for Angular? I actually haven't heard about Angular team talking about hooks, or there was the Vue team and there was the Preact team. That's a good question. Angular hooks. I am. I imagine you won't actually see them in there because I don't know, Angular, is Angular functional components actually a thing? Components? Because the hooks only make sense from the like functional component perspective, right? Stateless Angular components. I guess you could do them. Uh, come on, website. Oh, there we go. Whoops, no, that was the wrong button. Stateless components. Uh, yeah, that does not look very functional. I guess it just doesn't make a lot of sense in Angular to have hooks because you don't really have functional components in there, right? But okay, let us continue. We can talk about hooks a bit later when we talk about the React release in the releases section. But for now, we got the next article that is called Service Workers Beware Safari's Range Requests. Um, 
The article talks about the uh, Safari edge case because of course Safari has edge cases in handling the some of the requests in service workers, specifically the caching videos uh, using the service worker with the range header. So um, normal browsers as in the Firefox, Chrome and Edge actually behave in the way that you would expect them to while Safari expects your server to serve the headers in a very specific way that is specified in Safari docs, which is a good thing. But um, yeah, this is like very weird problem and um, you can solve it yourself by using a regular expression cell. So essentially if you wanna cache videos for Safari and you're interested in seeing what kind of quirks you might encounter, then do check this article out. It can give you some uh, insights into the video caching. Let me have a look at the chat. What Twitter accounts I must follow that post interesting stuff about the front end development? Uh, what's your opinion? Well, I will. Uh, so basically, there is a bunch of uh, there was there was an awesome Twitter thing, wasn't there? Awesome JavaScript. I think like the best place to go is um, awesome lists, and there's always those awesome JavaScript Twitter or whatever. Forty one JavaScript experts to follow on Twitter. There we go. That that's the article. Um, <laughs> For new buys, that is a tricky question. Uh, it's really hard for me to say because I typically follow the guys who work on the, you know, like Chrome team or Firefox team because they usually post wide range of things, not just uh, in-depth looks, but also the uh, pretty basic stuff. So I guess I would say follow them as well. So Adios Mani, for example, is incredible. His work is always great and it ranges from very basic articles to a pretty in-depth things that are like deep dives into Chrome dev tools and stuff like this. Paul Irish is great. Um, I don't know who she is. I don't know this guy. Chris Heidman is great. So his stuff, he has a lot of uh, newbie coding uh, things as well. Yes, follow me, of course. I. <laughs> I'm I'm abysmal at shilling for myself. So thank you for shilling for me. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so code po age, Chris Heilman, he's great. He posts a lot of uh, very newbie friendly stuff. Uh, Brendan Ike, I actually don't follow him. I should probably fix it, but he's lately been tweeting a lot of uh, brave stuff and not that much JavaScript related thing. Same with John Rezik, don't really follow him. Um, so let me think, so who is here as well? Tracy Lead is great, Lady Lead, yeah, she, she posts some quality stuff. Can see dots, absolutely. This is the guy to follow if you want the um, articles. Yes, I will throw the link over here and just look through that. Uh, I mean, you can also, by the way, that's the, that's the thing. So you just go to my Twitter, you look at who I follow and find the people who have JavaScript and they bio. So those guys is the basically I follow and they, I can uh, wholeheartedly recommend because they are great. This is like the best I can do basically at this point. Um, you can also join our Discord server. The link is in the channel description and ask there. So I will be more than happy to um, suggest more people to follow there basically. But okay, let us continue. The next article we got is the ideas behind React Easy State utilizing ES6 proxies. I've already did a React Easy State tutorial and already talked about it more than once. It's a really cool um, solution to storage that is completely reactive, but used in a very simple way when you just assign properties. It uses the ES6 proxy under the hood and it works quite well for majority of cases. Um, and this article essentially deep dives into the inner working of the React Easy State. So how exactly is ES6 proxy used to achieve this react reactiveness while, you know, being just a simple JavaScript object. And uh, this is just one of the displays of the incredible power of ES6 proxies that allows you to do pretty crazy things. And in every time I see articles like this, I think man, I should probably learn ES6 proxies more and try to figure out how to use them in some of my, you know, real life, but uh, that never came up. Um, now, one of the concerns I have about React Easy State is that it does triggers a lot of re-renders in React, right? Because every time you assign a property, it will trigger this uh, view re-render. And I'm not sure how that will work with the uh, upcoming async React. So I'm assuming it's probably not gonna break anything, but 
I want, what, like there was one of the problems that we hit when I used it in one of the projects is that um, we had we had to set multiple properties depending on the request results and you know like one request set property second request depending on it set another property and so on and so forth so it was a pretty complicated tree and uh, there is a way around that um, that the React Easy State authors recommend which actually never worked out for me so we had like a bunch of components auto refreshing based on that. And um, yeah, it was a bit weird experience. So I essentially switched to unstated. Uh, but anyway, I'm sort of straying out from the article. The article actually talks about ES6 proxies basically and how the React easy state works, how the view and store components work. And um, if that sounds interesting, so if you're interested in uh, ES6 proxies, then this is really good place to find uh, or to read about them and to figure out how to use them for a pretty complicated case, actually. If you're not interested in the S6 proxies, well, in, you know, proxy traps and stuff like this, then there's probably nothing interesting over here, aside from maybe React Easy uh, State itself. It is a very nice library that works really, really well for simple cases and uh, might have some edge cases, uh, but, you know, then again, maybe they already solved it because I haven't actually had a look at it for quite some time. So maybe I should check it out again and revisit it and see how much it changed since the last time I touched it. Uh, anyway, pretty good article, uh, very good description of ES6 proxies and how you can leverage them uh, for sort of native reactivity, let's put it this way. All right, next article we got is uh, NPM explained by directing a movie. Yes, this, this is a title that I never thought I would see, but uh, there we go. So essentially it talks about how does NPM works, like literally how does NPM installs packages, how does it fetches remotes, how does it manages the versions, how does it writes the log files from a perspective or by complaining it to directing a movie, right? So if you are confused by the NPM workings, how does NPM install works? How does NPM uninstall works? How does the things sort of work together, right? Um, check it out. It does pretty good job explaining it by, well, directing a movie, exactly as the title says. It's a very interesting analogy that I never thought I would um, that would fit it, but it actually does fit quite well. So if you're confused how NPM works, um, try directing a movie, NPM movie, I guess, and uh, check this article out. It is quite good. All right, next article we got is basic functional programming with JavaScript. Uh, this is uh, definitely a newbie friendly article, very, very basic. Again, it says basic functional programming, so exactly what you should expect from it. If you already know the basics of functional programming, you won't find anything new here. If you are interested in functional programming, but never ever heard about it, or maybe, you know, just heard the name, but never heard about the concepts, do check this article out. It gives you all the basic concepts like pure functions, side effects, shared states, uh, mutable data, and so on and so forth, deterministic functions. And walks you through the very basics that you basically need to know to get started with, um, yes, basic functional programming. I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm repeating the word basic a bit too much here, but uh, there you go. Um, what's the benefit? What's the benefit of functional programming or of the article? <laughs> I gotta know because <laughs> this is slightly confusing. I'll give you a few seconds to answer this. Uh, do you mean what's the benefit of functional programming? Now there's the awkward silence because the Twitch chat is lagging as usual. Um, functional programming. So what's the benefit of function? No, it's not just better at a billion. I mean, it's different, right? So it's a different paradigm. It's sort of like you got MVC and then you got MMVM, right? For example, or you got like object oriented programming, you got functional programming, and then you got 20 other patterns. Like it's a, just a different pattern, right? And it's it can, immensely simplify your code if you know how to apply it correctly, right? For example, in JavaScript, um, so JavaScript is, is the language that is not purely functional, but it allows you to write very functional code. And I think like, at least in my opinion, I figured that for me, um, using functional programming, like trying to write purely functional programming in JavaScript doesn't work because JavaScript just doesn't have all the tools that are required for making it purely functional. Like you don't have immutable data. You anyway have a global shared state 
being, you know, global dot something or window dot something. And it's really hard to evade problems and side effects, right? But if you use a bit of functional programming and mix it in with um, the rest of the code, you can simplify th some things immensely. Like the React hooks is one of the examples of applying functional programming to um, JavaScript and making your codes 20 times easier. Um, wait a second, let me try it. So I'm gonna go to Twitter and we'll try to find the example of React hooks. There was a few tweets that uh, gave an examples of what actually changes when instead of classes, you start using hooks. And holy moly, some of those look just insanely simpler. And um, let me try Like one, one of the examples is obviously Dan's um, speech in the React conf. So maybe let me try to find, there's gotta be, gotta be a simple example over here. Oh, wait, no, I think it was not Dan's actually talk, but the next talk. Yeah, it was Ryan's talk uh, from the, uh, was it? Oh man, come on, let me try. What kind of modules would you classify? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of down to come down, you know, do you need this abstraction or not? Because if you can get away without using, um, if you can get away without using classes, then you should because classes create overhead, right? Mental overhead. Yeah, there you go. So this is a sort of example from the React uh, conf. And uh, this is the example of handling the window, um, window resize, right? So in the React component, what you would do is you would create this, okay, we mounted, so we have to add the event listener, and then we have to store this event listener in the class. And then once we unmount, we have to actually remove the event listener. And then once it changes, we have to actually change state. And there's like, a you know, you have to, if you forget to unmount, if you forget to clean it up on unmount, it's going to be your problem and you're going to have a memory leak. Uh, with the functional programming, you're going to use an effect. In this case, it's the React hook effect, right? And basically what you do is you just call a function that says, okay, we're going to add event listener and then we're going to return a cleanup function. This is, again, this is a very functional programming pattern, basically. Very um, a pattern that is very familiar to people who are working with functional programming, you return a cleanup function that will be called for you. So you don't have to worry about that too much. And it's all nice and compact and in one place instead of you know being distributed over five different methods in a React class. This is sort of the things that are incredibly powerful about functional programming, the simplification of some things, but it's not, uh, don't think that it's going to be, um, you know, cure for everything is going to simplify every code. If you, if you apply, if you try to apply it to everything, well, you can do that. It's, uh, it might result in some terrible things happening in, <laughs> in JavaScript, at least I've seen some, I mean, it's like, it's basically, you know, you cannot, it, it, it's, um, how do I put it? So you can write just as terribly written code in functional paradigm as it would be in object oriented paradigm. There's just gonna be different kind of problems. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. But um, I, I would say this definitely is definitely worth learning functional programming and trying to learn at least one purely functional language like Clojure or I don't know, Haskell or something like this, you know, where you, you have this, the f functional programming basically uh, the language that is purely functional, right? So you you cannot write with classes essentially. It 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 changes the way that you think about software development at some point. So I think the learning closure script and closure uh, learned me uh, t uh, taught me quite a lot of things about um, the ways that you can actually think about software development because functional programming is not just using functions, it's also thinking about your program in terms of data and functions, not classes and methods. So it's, it's very different. If you, if you don't know, fun, if you never worked with functional programming at all, I would say it's definitely worth learning it and trying to uh, see how it works. You know, maybe, maybe you won't like it, maybe you won't stick with it, but the things you can learn from it will benefit you greatly. I'm, I'm like 99% sure of it. Uh, let me have a look at the chat. Uh, pure functions is key of functional programming. Uh, it's, I mean, it's one of the things. So it's not just, there are still side effects. And while you do write pure functions, most of the time it's not sort of, you know, hey, we're only using pure functions. That's also not quite correct. 
The function returns exactly the same result. Well, yeah, deterministic functions is also one of the concepts, but again, you, you also have the side effects in functional programming. And there might be cases when you cannot work without having side effects. Like that just, it's like, it's not as strict about that as you might imagine. A version of a function does not modify some state outside. Once again, you have side effects. So that's also not completely true is some functions can have side effects. They can modify stuff outside. Basically, just if, if that sounds interesting, learn closure script, learn Haskell or something like this, just go through tutorial and try to build a simple, very simple app like command line app that does something, you know, request and outputs it on screen. And you will see just how different it is to object oriented programming and how can change your thinking about the software development. Okay, enough about functional programming. Let's continue with the news. Um, the next article we got here is building ambitious apps with MDX. Learn how MDX works and create a blazing fast app in no time. This is a tutorial that walks you through creating an app based on MDX, which is the markdown with JSX, which basically allows you to use the React components inside of markdown and to serve that app uh, locally and then to add some features to it. And because this is Oath0 blog, you will also add Oath0 authentication. So obviously they're shilling for them. That's always nice. Um, I mean, nothing super complicated here. So if you ever wanted to try MDX and were was confused about where to start, then check this article out. It is as usual from the all zero guys, very detailed, very step-by-step, -step, very novice friendly. So it has everything to get you started. It's quite good, but you know, there's nothing super special about it. So it's just basically a tutorial on creating a React app with MDX and uh, using React components in it. Quite good nonetheless. So if you're interested in MDX, do check it out. If not, then well, might as well skip it. Next article we got is, um, yes, this is probably one of my favorite ones this week. Playing Mortal Kombat with TensorFlow.js, transfer learning and data augmentation. Um, a bit of machine learning here, but it does talk about TensorFlow.js. So I, you know, it's kind of related to JavaScript. So I'm just gonna roll with that. This article uh, teaches you how to build a TensorFlow.js model that will um, allow you to control Mortal Kombat using your body and a web camera. And it's a very detailed article. It does assume you know, uh, you have some basic understanding of the machine learning and neural networks and how they work and how the TensorFlow works as well. Um, there are other articles from the same author. I believe this is his blog basically, yeah. Uh, so you can find other articles that give you more basic introductions to the TensorFlow.js. Uh, but it is really cool. So you can literally build your own uh, model that will allow you to play Mortal Kombat by basically waving your hands and legs around, which is kind of fun. So if you ever wanted to do that, do check it out. The article is quite in-depth and it walks you through all you need to know to build a model like this. I think it's a pretty fun little project for a weekend. And uh, while, you know, you probably won't be playing Mortal Kombat on a competitive level with that, nonetheless, it's still a very fun thing to do. So there you go. Um, just check it out. It's pretty fun. Uh, you know, even if you don't build it, just read through it and uh, you will probably find some very interesting points. Okay, next article we got is one more related to functional programming, actually understanding carrying in JavaScript. So carrying is one of those functional programming concepts that is incredibly powerful and worth knowing if you, even if you don't know functional programming, if, in, even if you don't plan to use functional programming, because it can be applied outside of functional programming and can save you a lot of um, pain, basically. Yes. Um, so this article talks about carrying. It walks you through just about everything, starting from what is carrying, how do you actually use it in real life and how you can create carryable functions and even some theory from mathematics because, you know, functional programming is heavily based. I mean, it's literally completely based on the mathematical um, aspects and um, and this uh, article includes the theory as well. So you can, uh, if you are this kind of guy who was, who is heavily into mathematics, check it out. And uh, yes, if, if not, then you can just skip that part and read everything else because it does walk you through just about everything you need to know about carrying. And uh, I think it's a very important technique to know in JavaScript because it can save you a lot of time and a lot of, um, simplify a lot of cases basically. All right, 
The next article we got is, I think, the last one. No, that's not the last one yet. This is the uh, last one with regards to code we have today. It's called Streams for the Win, a performance comparison of Node.js methods for reading large data sets. There's a comparison of how you can use read file, create read stream and event stream, um, and how do they differ essentially for parsing very large files. So the setup is quite straightforward. You got a very big file um, over two and a half gig uh, in size with a lot of lines. The data is split by lines and then you have to read it somehow using Node.js. The obvious solution number one, use read file, which I, it's actually not true that it's not gonna work. So the JavaScript will complain and it will say heap is out of memory, but you can actually make it work because you can pass to Node.js a flag that will say, hey, increase the heap memory for me. So if you have enough RAM to load that into memory, you can actually make that work, but that's not gonna be very efficient. The second solution the author uses is create read stream and read line, uh, which kind of works, but not completely. And I will explain in a second why. And the third solution is using uh, create read stream and then using event streams to actually split it and properly process it as a stream, which obviously works the best. There is a GitHub repo here that uh, shows the code and the article talks a bit more in depth about the used code and why it worked and why it didn't and what are the performance of that stuff. Um, so, you know, if it sounds interesting, check it out. There's some interesting insights. I just want to note a few things that I think uh, were not quite clarified in the article. So there is three files over here, read file, everything is clear. You know, we just take a file, we read it all in memory and then work with the stuff in memory, not very efficient, especially for large data sets. We have the read file stream here, which does the right thing and creates a stream, but then actually uses the read line, which splits the stream on lines, right? Um, the problem with it is that read line will emit every line as a event. Um, and the issue here, uh, the author basically said she hit the same problem as with the read file, it all loads in memory. And the problem here is that it actually happens because the read line does not pause on every line, right? It's gonna do that. So as soon as the new line comes, it's gonna emit it into the event, which means it's not much different from actually reading the whole file into memory. And the third solution, uh, which works correctly is using the, for example, in this case, uh, the author uses the event streams, uh, the way that's a wrong file, um, this one. She uses event streams to actually pipe it to the split, which does exactly the same as the um, read line by line, but makes it in a stream manner. And then you can actually map over those lines and do whatever you want in a stream manner once again. And that will be executed as a proper stream of lines essentially, right? I want to know that there is an even easier solution, which I prefer actually when work with uh, large files. And uh, the solution that actually successfully worked for me for files up to 20 gigs is uh, Highland.js, which is one of my favorite libraries for working with streams in Node.js. And uh, what you can do is you can literally wrap the source into a Highland function. And then there is a um, split by function, which does exactly what you would expect. So you can split by the slash n for splitting it into lines. And then you can have, you have basically the array methods, which is map, or in this case, it also has a very cool uh, stream methods, which is a flat map, which can, which means that you can actually map a line into another function that will return a stream. And that stream will be executed and only then the next line will be processed, which is very handy for processing super large things and doing some complex interactions. So this is actually a really cool case. And uh, if you're interested in processing data, I would highly recommend checking out Highland.js for stream processing. All right. And the last, uh, no, wait, that's, is that, no, that's not the last article I got. I'm, I'm forgetting things, but okay. The next article we got today is um, a bit of a weird one. It's called Headless WordPress plus Next.js, what we learned. <clears throat> and it talks about using WordPress as the headless backend for your website, I or headless CMS, um, which is, I actually didn't know was a thing up until now. So up until finding that article. So what the authors do is actually they take the, uh, web, uh, God damn it, WordPress, and they use it as a headless CMS, the backend, right? To build the website that will be then uh, rendered by the Next.js and React, which 
Um, sounds a bit crazy, but apparently it works. And apparently it is quite common uh, practice among the people using WordPress because, I mean, I guess it makes sense because the WordPress does gives you just about everything you want to have from the CMS, right? So you just need to basically render it in a nice way and you're done. I'm not sure what the benefits of using the Next.js in front of it instead of just running with the web, uh, WordPress itself. I guess if you close the WordPress off from the you know rest of the world, it's going to be more secure, but uh, just a bit weird. But, you know, if you had a case like this and if you are using headless WordPress and want to render it with Next.js or React, uh, do check it out. There are some very interesting insights into that right here. If you are curious about the use case as well and just interested in seeing how that all worked out, do check it out as well. It is it is a very interesting article. There are some pretty cool insights in here. It's just, uh, it just feels a bit weird, you know. Uh, but okay, next thing we got is the thing that I already showed today once on the podcast is the React Conf. So this week there was two days of React Conf and there are two videos from day one and day two. They are pretty large and... Um, um, I think there's like about two hours of content every day. Okay, one and a half hour first day, they actually cut some stuff out. But uh, you can go to the React Conf or the um, list of um, articles here and there's both days linked here and watch through them. There is some announcements related to React like Hooks, for example, with really cool examples. And I haven't watched day two yet, so I don't know what was announced there or what was shown off there, but I'm sure it's uh, quality content. So I... Uh, quite, uh, quite highly recommend uh, checking it out if you have time for that. What are streams mean on Highland.js? This uh, Highland.js is the um, uh, node library only. So it is, I oh, know it actually browser works in browser now, but I mostly use it for node streams. So as in, you know, Node.js uh, stream, um, as in this streams where you can create a stream and then stream the data over the time in it, like for example, web sockets or Unix sockets or uh, reading from file in a stream manner like byte by byte and stuff like this. Um, there was this definite, wait a second, guide to streams in nodes. There was this really cool guide. Yeah, the definitive guide to object streams in Node.js. I think that was the thing. Uh, there was a GitHub repo for that. Ah, stream handbook, there we go. So if you are unfamiliar with the streams concept, I just shared the link on the in the chat. Uh, it's called Stream Handbook from uh, Mr. Substack. And it's a really good book that will introduce you to the concept of streams and everything you have to know about them, at least from the node side. But um, I mean, other streams are not too different from that, to be honest. So do check it out. Okay. And the last article we got today is don't make squirrel burgers. And it talks about, well, there's some very terrible story actually um, <laughs> told here about squirrel burgers, but it essentially talks about not caving in and not, you know, estimating your work without including stuff like refactoring and automated tests and estimating, hey, we can do this in one month, but then we need one more month to write automated tests and refactoring. And um, you should always, so basically the takeaway from this story is that you should always include automated testing, refactoring and improving the code quality in your software development estimates because it is your quality of life things that should not be forgotten because you are the developer who's gonna maintain this code and who's gonna suffer if they are not included in the long term. Um, do read it. It's not very long. It's just like a couple of pages. And I think it makes a very valid point. And next time you make estimates for your manager, do include those co like quality of life uh, things into the estimate as well, because in the long run, it's going to save time for you too. Okay, that's it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the shorter sized things that we have today. And the first one is getting started with Next.js in five minutes. If you are still not sure what Next.js is or how to get started with it, do check this article out. It is very tiny. It will get you started with Next.js in five minutes. And it's a great starter that explains everything you need to know about Next.js. Uh, by the way, Next.js is my favorite framework. So do check it out. Highly recommend it. Next thing we got is eliminate an entire category of bugs with a few simple tools. Uh, speaking about JavaScript as usual, this is an intro to uh, linting and formatting tools that will help you save 
quite a bunch of headaches and problems that you might have with your code, specifically talking about ESLint, Prettier, Flow and TypeScript, uh, and uh, you know tools like this that can save you time just by enabling them and linting your code and saying, hey, there might be something wrong over here. So if you never use those tools to check this article out, it will get you started quite nicely. And as a person who uses, well, most of those tools on pretty much daily basis, I can highly recommend setting them up at least locally for yourself. And even better if you do it for the project completely, because they will save you a lot of time. Next thing we got is the Intel Relative Time Format API, the new API that is coming in the um, Chrome, landing in the Chrome soon, and I believe in the other browsers as well. That allows you to get relative time, which is something that is, you know, you no longer need library for that. That is just awesome. So you can actually do stuff like format 50 minus 15 minutes, and it will tell you 15 minutes ago. And it will actually tell this to you in the user locale, which is just quite awesome. Like basically it just eliminates another library that you need. Just check it out. This is really cool that it's coming to the browsers. Um, and yes, it's going to be in all locales. So really great to see that. Next thing we got is this small tip for uh, copying an object instead of, uh, you know, if you need an object, but don't need one of the properties, the one of the ways to do this is obviously just copy the object and then delete the property. But what you can actually do is you can take the property and then spread the rest of the object into a second variable. And this is a really tiny, nice way of doing it. I never thought about that you could do that. But this is actually how destruction works, right? You can literally use rest to get the rest of the object and then just drop one of the properties. So quite neat. Next thing we got is this demo of the async version of react that is coming quite soon. And, uh, you know, looking at the suspense release, and now the hooks release, it's getting closer and closer to the release, according to the Dan's Twitter as well. Uh, applying the a sync version of react on real world app. So as you can see here, here's the current version, it is quite slow. And you know, if you scroll really fast, it's going to be lagging. And once you switch to the async renderer, the app becomes well, very responsive. This is just incredible. And it's literally just five lines of code change, just a version of react, essentially, really excited to see it come. And uh, yes, we're going to check out how it's going to turn out in a real world. Okay, next thing we got is JavaScript public class properties are coming to Chrome. So that thing that you had to enable by Babel plugin to uh, run, you know, with a uh, react, for example, we have quite frequently used the state like this, for example, they're going to be landing in Chrome quite soon. So we got intent to ship over here. So I'm guessing one or two more versions, and we're going to have that in Chrome. And we're if we're super lucky, we're likely gonna get that, uh, get that in node version 11, which is, um, you know, which just got released. We're gonna talk about that in the release section. So pretty cool to see that. I'm gonna see how that develops. Really awesome to see that at least in Chrome. I'm quite curious how quick is gonna be delivered into the Firefox and other browsers, but uh, we're gonna see. Next thing we got is this tiny suspense starter, I guess. So if you haven't heard react 16.6 was shipped and it includes suspense. Now we can actually do uh, lazy loading for components using the react native abstractions. And all you have to do, you can just add suspense with a fallback, wrap it around your components uh, or route or page or whatever, and then use lazy wrapper around the component that has to be loaded lazily. And that's it. That is the code splitting and lazy loading in react works really well. And um, it's really, really cool. Which days do you build? Um, you mean the coding live streams that is typically happens on Wednesday, there is a timer in the channel description. So you can just see it well, like Wednesdays, uh, 7pm uh, Berlin time. But yeah, there's basically a calendar down below on the Twitch page. So you can just check it out over there. Okay, um, next thing we got here is the nifty curl rc config to extract performance data for command line fetches uh, first of all i didn't know curl rc was a thing second of all this is really cool that you can actually define custom format for curl that will show you some timing uh this is really awesome i already did that to my curl rc and um yeah it's it's <laughs> quite nice so if you're using curl a lot check it out this is quite nifty Next thing we got here is, and I think this is the last uh, tiny news announcement tidbit thingy, uh, is that the 
Node.js modules team reached consensus on phases two and four of ESM implementation, which means that the day when we see the Node.js ESM modules is getting closer. It's still probably somewhere like one year away, according to Mr. Miles Borins, but it is coming. And you know, the fact that they have finally reached consensus on how all of that should be done is really great to see. So yes, quite excited for that. Still not digging .mgs files, but you know, what the hell, we're gonna see how that develops. All right, that's it for the tiny things. Now we are coming to the releases section and the first major release of the week is Node.js 11 and Node.js 10 go into LTS in the next couple of days. Um, I think it's still not LTS just yet, but they're gonna be releasing LTS quite soon, probably next week. Um, so if you're using Node 8 as LTS, it's about time to switch to Node 10. If you are living on the edge, then be sure to install Node 11. It includes V8 7.0 and a bunch of bug fixes. And unfortunately, I mean, I'm not sure actually, unfortunately or not, because I never used FreeBSD, but they dropped support for FreeBSD 10. I'm not even sure if that's the latest version of FreeBSD, but hey. Anyway, really cool to see a node moving forward with, um, you know, just as planned basically. And uh, yes, HTTP2 is ready in LTS now. Uh, node 10 LTS is gonna be um, featuring V868, which brings memory improvements, speed improvements, and NPM64. So yeah. Basically, no reason not to update unless you have some legacy packages that require no dates, which I know that there are some of them, which is a bit annoying, but hey, so check it out. Okay, next thing we got is React 16.6 with lazy memo and context type, something we kind of talked a bit about already. First of all, we got the react.memo util that allows you to memoize functional components, which basically should replace the pure component and should component the blade thing which essentially does the same. So you just wrap your uh, React function react.memo and unless your prop changes, the component will not re-render, which is a nice addition, a very welcome one. We got the react.lazy with suspense, which again, something that Dan Street already highlighted. So all you have to do is wrap your uh, lazy loading component into lazy and then create a suspense placeholder. And that's basically it. Everything else will be handled by React, which is kind of amazing. And we also got the static context type access. So once you create context right now, you can uh, specify a static context type property on your React component and specify the context that you want to access. And then in every method in your component, you can actually access this co context now and get the context directly, which is really cool. So you no longer have to access it just from the render, which is can make it very nice for some use cases basically. Still more excited about the hooks than all of that stuff, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, hey, you know, those are great additions as well. Next release we got is Firefox 63, which features the major release of web components. Yes, web components are finally in Firefox and we now have custom elements, shadow DOM and all that related stuff. Uh, we also have the fonts editor, which actually looks quite amazing, to be honest, in the DevTools. And there is some additional minor improvements to it. So, you know, if you're using Firefox for development, that is quite exciting. Um, next release we got is Atom 132, which, which they finally shipped the tree seeder parsing system uh, enabled by default, which should make the editor way faster than it was before and way more efficient. So really cool news for people using Atom. Uh, I'm still curious about how the whole Atom and VS Code situation will unfold since the Microsoft just finished the acquisition of GitHub and this is kind of GitHub product and the VS Code is Microsoft product. So two products, um, I'm really curious how all of that will develop basically. All right, next, and I think this is the final release of the week we got here is the React Spring 6.0, the animation framework, declarative animation framework for React version 6.0 with um, better, simpler and more performant options. So if you were looking for a way to declaratively animate your React components, check it out. It is really nice. I've tried it in a couple of projects and it's uh, quite a joy to use. And I think they already started experimenting with React hooks, which <laughs> makes it even better in my book. Okay, that's it for releases. Now we are coming to the demos section. The first thing we got here today is actually a pretty cool 
uh, addition from the REPL. We now got the REPL.run that allows you to ship the terminal apps as websites, which is kind of mind blowing, but is really, really cool. And my JavaScript is probably blocked, so it's not gonna load, but uh, let me just fix that real quick. Rebel run dropped connection to remote machine. Um, I do you not like my ad blocker maybe? Nope, okay, some, I, oh, I guess I need to log in first. But anyway, you can literally ship your command line apps in the browser now and play with them. Uh, and it is awesome. This is indeed very awesome. So if you were looking to try it out and maybe ship your own app in here, do check it out. There's for example, a snake over here and uh, you can uh, play a snake in the browser. Three, two, one, and there we go. We're probably gonna be playing a snake right now. Where's my snake? Uh, how do I, WASD? No, not WASD, how do I? Oh, there we go. I can play snake in a, in a browser, the console snake with dots and everything, and uh, it actually works relatively well, which is <laughs> kind of crazy. So yeah, do check it out, seems to be really cool. Next thing we got is the GraphQL designer. Open source uh, tool for designing GraphQL with uh, React. It's a visual GraphQL schema and queries and everything designer that you know you can just design it visually and then you get the code for it. Uh, seems pretty slick and nice. So you know if you're working with GraphQL a lot, do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. If you don't want coding, you just want the app itself. There is graphqldesigner.com. So you might as well just check it out. You can even select the database type, which is really great. Yeah, pretty neat. Uh, next demo we got is Web Perl. Yes, you can write Perl for web now. Somebody just took and compiled Perl for uh, WebAssembly using Encrypton, and um, you can now write Perl in web. Um, that's a thing. So <laughs> if you are a fan of Perl, do check it out. This seems to be quite cool. Next demo we got is React Win32 Dialog, which is literally Windows uh, 32, like the old Windows dialogs in React. So if you wanted to add a bit more Windows to your website, you, you can now do that. That looks amazingly well, actually well made. Uh, I, I think there should be a demo somewhere, right? It, it has to be a demo there. There you go. Oh, 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 oh yeah, that, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I think we should add this to the JavaScript game we're building on a Wednesday stream. This looks awesome. <laughs> oh my God. You can, you, can, you can actually do that. That is cool. Perl is cancer. I, I mean, Perl is actually great. I don't know why you hate it so much, but Perl is a very nice little language. And uh, I know that it allows for a lot of custom things that you can, you know, redefine a lot of things in it and create your custom functions and custom global variables and custom global pragmas and whatever. And because of that, there's a lot of very trashy code in it. But I don't think I would say that I hate Perl as language per se. There's actually the latest version of Perl actually looks quite nice. But hey, you know, that's, that's just me. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is IronDB, a relentless key value store for the browser. Um, it's, it's a key value store that is supposed to be very relentless just as the title says and it supports a bunch of different storages you can use even multiple of them and uh, seems to have you know a sync of eight promise based api quite nice seems okay so you know if we're looking for a browser based storage key value store check it out uh, this one called looks quite neat next thing we got is the platform with the subtitle web.components dot and um this is the thing that was literally announced moments after the React hooks were announced because people were so hyped about the React hooks that they already built a thing <laughs> that has React hooks in there. So this is basically a React hooks implementation for different web features like the device motion, device orientation, geoposition, network status, media, scripts, and uh, this is how you use them. You just say, hey, style sheet or Windows scroll position, and you just get X and Y. This is why hooks are amazing, by the way. This just shows you how awesome they are. All you have to do to get Windows size with updates and everything is literally call one function. And this is, this is great. <laughs> this is awesome. Cannot complain. So yes, uh, once the React 16.7 is shipped with the hook support, this is definitely gonna be one of the must have things in your app, I guess, if you're, you know, if you're working with a platform. Uh, the name platform is a bit, yes, but um, there you go. <laughs> All 
Okay, next thing we got is lazy brush, smooth drawing with mouse finger or other pointing device, essentially an implementation of the lazy brush that allows you to do smooth um, drawing and supports just about any input device because you know this actually can be quite tricky to implement yourself if you never tried that. So you can just use this lazy brush feature, uh, lazy brush package and uh, yeah it seems to be working very nicely tried it on my phone also works quite cool so if you want a smooth drawing for your canvas app then do check it out seems to be pretty cool next demo we got is face api js this is actually quite old one but i thought you know i never highlighted this on bxjs so i might as well highlight it right now it's a JavaScript API for face detection and face recognition using TensorFlow. So essentially, instead of setting up TensorFlow yourself, you can just use Face API and it will recognize faces in photos or real time in camera if you want to, which is really nice. And it has a very simple API. So there you go. If you wanted to have a camera that recognizes users um, or at least faces, you can do that right now in just a couple of lines of code. Next thing we got is the VS Code Glean extension for that provides a refactoring tool for React Codebase. Uh, so if you're a fan of refactoring tools for your editors, which I, I don't know, for whatever reason, for me that never worked. Uh, I always prefer to do it manually. I, maybe I'm just terrible at that. But there is things like, you know, extract thing, uh, extract a uh, component into a new file or... Um, extract component extract bits of code into a separate component or convert a function into a stateful component and other things that you typically do in react seems quite nice so this is a vs code extension as i said before if you are doing a lot of that do check it out might as well save you time and the last thing we got is a squirrelly gs a modern blazing fast and configurable template engine um yeah, it's a template engine. I don't know what else to say. It's a JavaScript template engine. Seems quite nice. There is a lot of things included and has a pretty basic syntax. So if you were looking for a template engine, do check it out. It is quite okay. That's basically all I have for today. Unfortunately, no interesting or silly non-JavaScript stuff today. Don't really have anything to tell you anymore. It's basically all I got. So if you guys have any questions or maybe you have some articles that I've missed or... Want to share something do throw them into chat right now if not we might as well go and uh, have a awesome rest of the weekend and play some red dead redemption maybe hmm, you know what i'm saying or maybe code something i don't know i don't know what what you want to do with your weekend <laughs> all right do you guys have any questions i'm gonna give you a couple of seconds uh meanwhile while you're thinking about the questions let me just chill a bit you can, as usual, find all the links that I've talked about in the GitHub repo under buildingxwithjs slash bxjsweekly. The link is in the description. As usual, you can find me on Twitter, on Twitch, on YouTube, or anywhere else. The links are, as usual, in the description. We also have a Discord server, which you can join if you need any help with JavaScript or you just want to talk about different things. We try to keep things chill in there. So we're always more than happy to see new people and help them with their uh, JavaScript woes. It seems like there's no questions. Uh, pew pew lasers. Yeah, this is the, <laughs> it seems like the, nobody wants to ask any questions or do anything and you just want to go and have, have some, you know, nice rest of the weekend, I guess. <laughs> yeah, all right, we can wrap it up here. So um, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for staying with me. And uh, as usual, thank you for your continued support. It was quite great. Um, thank you for watching once again. Have a rest. Have an awesome rest of the weekend. Or if you're watching the audio of this, have an awesome rest of the week. And I see you either on a Wednesday coding stream or on an next BXS weekly. Thank you for watching and bye.